to 15 minutes with Matt Gilbride and Dave Vesterkin, uh, who are developers for Chariot Solutions. My name is Keith Gregory. I'm the AWS Practice Lead, and I'm going to be acting as an interviewer today. So why don't we start with introductions. Matt, since you're on my screen right now, why don't you start? Uh, yeah, I've, uh, I'm a developer with Chariot Solutions. Um, I've been here three or so years now. At, I think it's been three projects across that time. Um, I do front end and back end work. Um, love it. Currently in a um, at a client that has some interesting requirements related to HIPAA regulations and auditing and things like that. Hi, my name is David Estrakin. I've been with Chariot for 15 years now. Uh, don't know how many. Don't know how many clients it's been. I'm at the same client as Matt right now, doing a, a different project. As he said, uh, some HIPAA compliance work here. And prior to this, I was working with a client for. Um, had some financial compliance concerns that were, uh, that was about three years on that project, I think. And the title of this uh, 15 minutes talk uh, Matt came up with is the 800 pound HIPAA in the room. So why don't we dive right into that and how HIPAA compliance, especially in a startup environment, which is where you're working now, kind of changes the way you, you work. Uh, Dave, you want to take that on? So, um, the project I'm working on has to do with uh, capturing data for a uh, clinical trial studies. And there's um, a fair amount of, well, HIPAA compliance is required for this, in, which touches on a couple of areas. Um, it has to be, the all information needs to be kept private, um, so nothing personal can be shared. Uh, and the um, tracking of any change needs to be kept to a minute detail about exactly who did what and when. And also we need to track, um, verify information that was not only uh, who was making the change, but the specific changes that were made and for an audit logging purposes. Diving into that, uh, I think when we had talked about this before, uh, Someone had said, we don't know what an auditor is going to ask, so we're tracking everything. Could you dive in a little bit more on what everything means? Well, um, Matt and I are working on different projects, and his is, his, they actually handled that slightly differently than we did. Basically, we, we take in, this is a web application we're writing, and we're taking in every single request that we get. Um, anytime anything would touch the database, we log exactly what the request coming in was, what the user was who made the request, and what changes would be made to the system. So. Um, while the functionality is not there right now, you could theoretically recreate everything from the audit logs from the, from when something, a piece of data was added to any modifications all along the way. And in addition, we track who viewed certain data. So even if they didn't make a change, we track um, whether a user looked at a, all the participants in a study or something like that. So it's tracking everything we can get for every interaction with the system. Okay. And Matt, um your project was slightly different and is actually involves controlled sharing of information. So do you want to talk about it a little bit and uh, what specific security concerns and audit logging requirements you had? Yeah, so actually to, to go back to a question you just asked to Dave too, I think at our, our previous client is where we had this kind of requirement in the financial services sector of we kind of need to log everything and we're not exactly sure what an auditor is going to ask. Um, and there, the approach we took is conceptually similar to, to the approach that, that Dave's team is taking uh, more or less. In, in my team's case, there's, we don't have the luxury of a single data store. Um, so we're talking about an application that's been around for a little bit longer and is a, you know, microservices app that's got multiple services talking to multiple data stores and executing an audit logging strategy in every single database for every single service was not something that could be done in a reasonable amount of time. Um, so the way that it's approached in my cases is, is in the reverse proxy in the Nginx, you know, gateway that sits in front of all these services. Um, essentially it's a strategy with some AWS services whereby we have essentially plain regular application logs kind of that any everyday developer would be familiar with. And then these audit logs that may contain, um, you know, personally identifiable information or perhaps medical information about a user. Um, and essentially the, the requirement is that we need to log everything just like Dave said, but those audit logs need to not be visible 
uh, even by the developers of the of the organization that that, that I'm working for. Um, so, using some pieces of AWS infrastructure, um, Firehose and Lambda, and you know CloudWatch log groups, and a, a kind of a special lockdown S3 bucket. We're able to split the log streams and send the plain logs to a normal log group, kind of an everyday log group that developers might look at, but then send the audit logs to a locked down S3 bucket that is only accessible um, by an auditor in the case of an audit. So you kind of mentioned something very interesting there, um, where individual developers are not allowed to see certain pieces of data. Um, could you talk a little bit more about that uh, and the, the various rules and protocols that you follow uh, working with data since, of course, to develop your application, you need some sort of data? Sure. Yes, I think, you know, my experience there has been, you know, somewhat in just the when you're working in a regulated environment, you just need to always be cognizant of that fact. Um, so. You know, for instance, Dave and I are working on laptops provided by the client. Um, we're very much kind of needing to do work through a VPN. Um, and then, you know, even when you're pulling down sample data or, you know, uh, some subset of data to test with that might be from a real environment, you need to be cognizant of that fact and that you really can't allow that data to get to go somewhere it shouldn't go. Um, one good example of this is a month or so ago, there was an issue. Uh, my you know, client issued laptop had a broken key and I couldn't use it. And you know, given the current environment, I also couldn't go get it fixed at an Apple store. So, you know, I think in other environments, I wouldn't hesitate to maybe grab my chariot laptop and check out the project on GitHub and just do some work. Um, but in this environment, you're kind of always, um, it's always important to ask. Uh, you know, one, one good point about, you know, working in a highly regulated environment like this is that security just generally you know, it's always important, but it's that much more important. Um, so I asked, hey, is it okay if I just check out this project to do some work um, on my Chariot laptop for the day? And the answer was a resounding no, um, which is maybe something that, you know, wouldn't happen elsewhere. But so it's just a small thing there. Okay. Well, important to know. Um, Dave, you had mentioned with your uh, process of doing releases, that you have a very uh, restrictive process where you have to completely plan your sprints in advance. Uh, nothing is released when it's ready. It all has to go in other companies. I've heard the term when the train leaves the station, everything has to be on it. And you also have to track information in a way that uh, can be tracked down, can't be changed, uh, right once approach. Can you dive into that a little bit? Uh, well, the release schedule is a little bit different, but the um, in terms of tasks that were developed for a for a um, a, a sprint or a, a development cycle, every there's a there's a specific tracking to that. There's the requirements are defined in, for the whatever the development task is, and that needs to be tied to the development ticket. And then every commit that's made that goes into the that get, makes it into the main branch is the um, is tied to that ticket and therefore tied back to the requirements. So that way there is an, an audit trail, not only of the, in the application, but actually of the code itself. Um, for the release cycle, there's a, a document which is written that contains the, the versions, which includes down to the Git hash of all the artifacts that are going into that release. So they can track back and say that this release contained these exact versions of all of these specific artifacts. Um, and that is all, put in a, a right one to read many bucket. Um, okay. One of the things that you had called out, Dave, on your project is handling of electronic signatures. Uh, since this clinical trial data is being uploaded by end users and uh, you want to be able to ensure that the users, once they upload it, you know it's coming from them and they aren't able to repudiate uh, that upload. Could you dive into that a little bit? Sure. So um, it's an interesting thing that basically in a clinical trial, what happens right now for the most part is the the person asking the questions or doing the review of the, of the patient has paper forms that they fill out and then they sign them and then they get filed away like that when this now is, has to be the electronic replacement of that. Um, so there, there's a standard for this that's uh, well, the 21 CFR part 11 was the phrase that gets thrown around all the time. 
And this is a standard for um, electronic signatures or digitally signing a document. And it is a, um, it's not just uh, the medical industry, it is a full standard for um, electronic signatures. And in this case, we needed to come up with a way to manage this for the forms that we were filling out. And it came down to the two parts, one verifying that the document was the actual data that the person attempted to save, and two, that the person saving it is the, is the person who filled out the form. Uh, to cover those in reverse order, to determine that this is the right, this is the person who actually filled out the forms um, when they attempt to save or submit that document, the, the token they're using, their authentication token is checked for how fresh it is. And if it has to be newer than, I think we set it to a minute right now. So if their authentication token is more than a minute old, uh, we actually require them to log in again whenever they sign off on a form. And then the whole, the whole all of the forms and that signature are, um, there's a, a hash is created for that and stored off. And then all of this is put in another write once bucket to, uh, to say that this is the, uh, the verified copy of this document. Excuse me, I'm sorry about that. Didn't turn that off first. Um, so that's, that's the way that we've, uh, we've applied the 21 CFR part 11 requirements. And with the right ones you're using, you would set an object lock so that, and a life cycle rule so that the information cannot be deleted for seven years, but then it's automatically deleted? Uh, well, th at this point, that's still an open discussion, but it's the plan right now is yes, they, they will be kept for that period of time. Um, somebody came back recently and said that that's not a global standard for HIPAA compliance. So... Uh, apparently, the project we're working on right now has a seven-year standard. Other ones may have different ones for this, so it's, it's a little bit unclear. But one of the nice things about the S3 object lock is you can set that to whatever time period you want. So if a different client or a different uh, project has a different compliance standard, they can make it 10 years or five or whatever they need to. Okay. Um, we're getting close to the end of 15 minutes, so switch back to Matt. Anything else you want to say or thoughts? Perhaps a little late, but I don't know if I actually explained what exactly the product was that we're working on. So briefly, oh. um, it's just a, it's a tool that allows um, academic institutions, hypothetically, but any institution doing research really to store and manage scientific data sets. So that includes um, text, data, images, any other metadata, and, and it also allows them to kind of draw connections between artifacts of those data sets and then share them with other institutions. And that includes kind of approval workflows so if you can imagine the process of you know maybe publishing a paper to a journal the the system very much mimics um that process so that's all that, that's it perhaps too late like i said but. now actually that leads me to a very interesting question for the sharing of data how much data are we talking about here uh, um in many cases massive amounts of data so I mean, typical data set might be multiple terabytes okay so terabyte scale, which leads yeah. me into uh, kind of my pet area of AWS, uh, and I'll wrap up with asking both of you, has working on AWS really helped with making this project work? Is there anything specific about AWS that is a benefit over environments that you've worked in in the past? Um, I know Dave had talked about the object lock a little bit, uh, and certainly storage of large quantities of data seems to be a strength of AWS. We are using a fair amount of uh, AWS infrastructure. The writing out of all of the audit logs is, is done with um, a couple of lambdas right now. And we have multiple write once S3 buckets. Um, I mean, we, we, could we do these things outside of AWS? Yes, but AWS does make it nice and convenient. And it was really interesting for uh, being able to test out some of these ideas. And you, know, you could fire up an environment relatively quickly and test out some of the infrastructure. So it, it, was, a, it was definitely a help in the situation. Yeah, and in our case, I think, you know, AWS, you know, that those choices were made before we got involved, but it's, it, it's a great fit, um, especially in the case of S3 for these massive amounts of data. Um, the, path, the path forward for this project also involves um, kind of the concept. So today, this approval workflow essentially takes a, a data set so to speak, from a, a private area that's, you know, where only logged in users to some organization can manage it to a public space where it's, that data is now publicly available to anyone. And there is motivation to provide sort of an interim space. So a, 
another pseudo public space where a data set publisher could publish that information, but that anyone wanting to access that information would need to pay themselves. Um, so AWS has this concept of a requester pays bucket, um, and we're going to be leveraging that that feature kind of going forward over the next few months. All right. Excellent. I think we're at our end of time, so I'm going to stop recording. And thank you both for participating. Thank you. Thanks, Keith.